every act of creativity begins with imagination. And by creativity, I don't mean just artistic creativity, such as writing a song or painting a picture. I mean any kind of creating new relationship, whether it be starting a conversation between two people, writing an email or an essay or a sermon, planting a garden, managing a nonprofit, engaging in the work of social justice, or indeed bringing colors together on a canvas or melody and lyric into a, a relationship in song. Every act of creativity begins with imagination, with an act of dreaming or faith or simply planning. Think about it. When you decided to join this Zoom meeting today, it came about because of some moment of hope or expectation, a moment of imagination that carried you forward, to click on a link to see if what you imagined might be found here. Perhaps it is, or perhaps you're finding something that is different than you imagined. There is always a gap between what we imagine or hope for and what we find. And I'll speak more about that in a moment. But right now, let's affirm and celebrate that spark of imagination, that point of possibility or potential or dream, as the poet and activist Teresa Soto put it. The spirit of life is carried upon the wings of imagination, inviting us into ever deeper relationship with life itself. Imagine that, the spirit of life, as simple and near to us as our imagination, ready to carry us into deeper meaning and purpose. Imagination carries us forward into life, and then we encounter a gap. The distance between what we imagine or hope for and what actually is. In the world today, this gap can seem like a chasm and it can be very frightening for many of us. In his book, A Hidden Wholeness, The Journey Toward an Undivided Life, Quaker author and teacher Parker Palmer writes, we live in a tragic gap, a gap between the way things are and the way we know they might be. It is a gap that, has nev that never has been and never will be closed. If we want to live nonviolent lives, we must learn to stand in the tragic gap, faithfully holding the tension between reality and possibility. This tragic gap can be encountered on both a personal and a global scale and in all forms of relationship and community. In every life, in whatever circumstances, we will find ourselves in situations not of our choosing and we will have experiences that we find profoundly difficult, sometimes even unbearable. In order to live in that tragic gap, Parker Palmer invites us to practice the powers that open the heart, that open the mind, that invite the soul into being. It seems to me that one of these powers is that of imagination, the choice to ask with curiosity what can be made of this situation? What can I make of this? What meaning can be found here? Depending on your theology, it could even be more explicitly spoken as a prayer. Spirit of life, what can be made of this? In the process of opening up to something new arising, something that integrates what we might wish for with what we actually have, we can create new meaning in our lives. We can open up new paths for loving and responsible action, no matter who we are and in what circumstances, no matter in what circumstances. In recent weeks, many of us watched the Olympics and witnessed the gymnast Simone Biles as she encountered her own gap between what she could imagine and what she could safely do. Like all accomplished athletes, she was well-versed in the art of imagination, 
as she visualized the complex airborne flips that she planned to achieve. But sensing new limitations in her body and imagining the potential for catastrophe that could take place, she made the bold and creative choice to step out of competition. It was a life-giving choice, not only for her, but for so many people who can benefit from imagining new pathways for self-care and perhaps also new ways of living that are a little less driven and competitive. Over the summer, I was reminded of a Canadian painter whose vivid imagination allowed her to live through profoundly difficult circumstances while also bringing beauty and joy to others. Maud Lewis was born in Nova Scotia in 1903. She had physical disabilities from birth and later developed rheumatoid arthritis. Despite living in a tiny one-room house with her husband and unable to afford art materials, she used boat paints and house paints, particle board and cardboard, virtually any surface she could find in that tiny one-room shack to create vivid pictures of the, round, of the world around her, which she sold as greeting cards for pennies. Here's one example. On the one hand, the painting is clearly representational. We can see her efforts to accurately render a Nova, Scotia, a Nova Scotia cove. And yet, we can also sense a distance between what Maud Lewis may have imagined the painting might become and what she could do. There are a number of painters at First Unitarian, and I suspect most of us can relate to that challenge. Maud Lewis's imagination, though, allowed her to navigate that gap and beautifully with simple shapes and well-placed color. There's a famous saying, do what you can where you are with what you have. Well, it's clear that she knew how to do that. We can also see her imagination very clearly at work in the next painting, where cows, the cows are almost identical as are the trees, which are a decidedly dreamy shade of pink. I'm reminded of Teresa Soto's poem and its lime green and frosting pink dreams. This is a very simple painting in some ways, perhaps not technically sophisticated in some ways, and, and yet, to quote the poem again, it is enough, so much more than enough. And I couldn't resist including this one last Maud Lewis painting of three black cats. <laughs> To me, this painting illustrates how the gap between imagination and reality can be bridged sometimes by humor and surprise, inviting in the spirit of life in a new and original way. Maud Lewis died in 1970 in Digby, Nova Scotia, and it was only toward the end of her life that her paintings sold for any more than a few dollars. Today, of course, they are very valuable collector's items, bringing immeasurable beauty and joy to the lives of others. Maud Lewis was someone who was able to use her imagination to create new meaning in a life that was very challenging. In her paintings, the gap between imagination and reality was filled with her own unique spirit in, one what, in what one biographer called an illuminated life. Like any visual artist, she created relationship between color, shape, subject, and light. She also created relationship, I would say, between circumstances and meaning. She asked, what can I make of this? How can I do what I can, where I am, with what I have? Of course, the creative imagination need not lead to something as concrete as a painting. It might instead lead to something that helps us find our way through a difficult passage of life. Recently, a five-year-old boy named Harvey Sutton became one of the youngest people ever to hike the entire Appalachian Trail, covering more than 2,100 miles in 209 days, with his parents, of course. <laughs> they credit imagination as one of the things that got him through that trip. He dreamed to plan, he was dreaming up plans as he walked along 
to make spaceships and houses and to host something called a lava party, whatever that might be. We can also think of the stargazers of ancient Greece or Babylon, people so long ago connecting the dots to create images out of their imagination to guide them and serve as signposts in the night. Wherever and whomever we are, each of us is working with very specific materials and making of them what we can. When we think of the events of our lives as if they were points on a map or stars in the sky, they might appear as a meaningless jumble. It's our ability to connect them meaningfully that matters. We can do that whenever we consider our lives in overview or when we look at one, any one situation or challenge. Can we imagine that something meaningful or even beautiful might be made of it? Can we imagine that even taking that attitude might make a profound difference in our lives, allowing us to actively shape life's meaning while at the, while at the same time receiving whatever life has to hand to us? Can we imagine being, in the words of the poet Donna Falds, both the weaver and the loom, creator and creation, the sower and the sown? If this sounds daunting, as it often does for me, can we perhaps imagine the deep and grounded assurance that we are indeed enough, more than enough, made from fragments of the galaxy, and that the antidote to our doubt is dreaming. Astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson is a modern, modern day stargazer. He's also someone who reflects on the meaning of our singular lives within the vastness of the universe. He writes, when you look for things in life like love, meaning, motivation, it implies that they are sitting behind a tree or under a rock. The most successful people in life recognize that in life, they create their own love. They manufacture their own meaning. They generate their own, mot their own motivation. Now, there are times when I find statements like this unrealistic, even arrogant, especially from people who have considerable privilege. And yet, these words do guide me once again toward the creative imagination, the what can be made of this. What a brave and empowering question to put to ourselves in partnership with the spirit of life. Of course, it is one thing to imagine, to open up to the creative process, to engage in its unfolding. It's quite another to know how it will turn out. Many sermon writers have imagined or conjured up a certain certainty, which sometimes can be comforting. One example is the famous line from Martin Luther King Jr. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Well, he was actually paraphrasing our Unitarian ancestor Theodore Parker who wrote something that, to my mind, leaves a little more to the imagination. I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I am sure it bends toward justice. This, it seems to me, points to the way our imagination may guide us to create a world of greater harmony and love. To live in the gap between the world we hope for and the world as it is. To enter into it with creative imagination, never with absolute certainty, but with our intuition and our inner wisdom as our guide. <clears throat> in a new book called Art and Faith, A Theology of Making, the artist Makoto Fujimura puts it this way. It 
in order to be effective messengers of hope, we must begin by trusting our inner voice, an inner intuition that speaks into the vast wastelands of our time. This process requires training our imagination to see beyond tribal norms, to see the vista of the wider pastures of culture. It is a part of our theological journey to see the importance of our creative intuition and trust that the spirit is already at work there. Our creative intuition, <clears throat> this is the gap between what I would like to be saying <laughs> <clears throat> our creative intuition, fused with the work of God or the spirit of life, can become the deepest seat of knowledge out of which a new creation can flow. In the days to come, as we ask ourselves what we can make of this wounded world and our place in it, may we know that our imagination is our ally. May we do what we can, where we are, with what we have inspired by so many others who are using their imaginations in the service of love and justice in their singular ways. As we do so, may we find our days illuminated by new meaning and purpose, joining with others and with life itself in deeper relationship each day 